This is Lead Time. Welcome to Lead Time. Tim Allman here. Jack Kalberg has a day off, but today I get to hang out with one of my favorite people on planet Earth, uh, Pastor Matt Peoples. How you doing, Matt? Oh, man, I'm good. The feeling's mutual, man. The feeling's mutual. No, nah, we're going to have a good time today. So the the context for the conversation today is the Unite Leadership Collective has a has a brand new missions class coming out. And uh, if you're not in the Kairos or Luther House community, this class is also available for you. You can go to uniteleadership.org uh, in the upper right hand corner is learning platform. And then on October 6th, you'll see uh, the missions class that's being dropped there. So would love to have as many students as possible go on this missional hermeneutic journey with us at the ULC. So let me start out with this question, Matt. Why is a missional hermeneutic necessary for Lutherans? Thoughts there, bud. Oh, man. Uh, how long do we have? So <laughs> <laughs> 30 this minutes. Is, this is what I would say. <laughs> we, we have an incredible gift to give. Our theology is the best theology for reaching the lost. It's, it's why I'm Lutheran. Um, I noticed that when we were planting churches. Um, you know, you take the Lutheran theology, word and sacrament, you know, our understanding of grace, our understanding of justification, sanctification, and you implant that in a contextual way in a community, you will reach people that many churches have a hard time reaching. Um, the issue is, you know, when we don't have a solid missional hermeneutic, we end up trying to bring too much in. And so the, the example I use is, about two years ago, we stepped out of uh, the full-time parish to go into uh, the Kairos network. And so in order to do that, we started financing four moves on our own. And I remember that first move, I had 27-foot Penske, right? And uh, we're loading this thing up. I think I'm doing good. And we get to like the very end and I look back in the garage and there's still so much stuff that can't go. And while it's not like the critical stuff, it's the stuff that has like this deep significance to me, the grill that my dad bought me on a father's day, you know, the fire pit that we sat around with the kids, the, you know, old trophies and high school memories and all that, like all that kind of stuff was still in the garage. And I realized in that moment, like in order for us to step into this new season, that stuff wasn't able to go with us. And so I kind of like had to allow myself to have a little bit of that grieving period. But I realized if I really wanted to step out into this new spot, I couldn't bring those things with me. And I think one of the issues is we try to bring too much into the culture and the context. And when we try and bring all that stuff in, we kind of sit there on the edge of the truck and we say, well, if this can't go, I'm not going. And then the people that end up losing out is, is the community, the lost people that need that connection to Jesus and need, need our theological scriptural understanding in order to really connect. And the problem is we're sitting at the back of the truck going, well, if it all can't go, I'm not going. And I think we need a much better philosophy with that. We need to really sit down and say, okay, what is it that does go and allows us to contextualize without losing the core of who we are, which I think is vitally important but realizing that that is far less than what we realize. Hmm. Well, the argument's going to be, Matt, what do you leave behind? Like, we're going to disagree on what gets left behind, right? And I think that's maybe in the LCMS mm -hmm. today where we're struggling is, is what, gets, what gets left behind. Because I'm just going to play maybe devil's advocate as far as this is not a devilish statement at all. But like, if you're going to compromise on the liturgy, like I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Many, mm -hmm. many will say like, I, it's all about, it's all about the liturgy. I was reading an article in uh, one of the mm -hmm. Lutheran publications. I forget which, which one, but it was uh, a brother in, in Japan. He's a missionary in Japan and someone is going to link his, his name for me. Uh, but he's kind of, his missionary approach is, is we're going to do, we're going to do uh, traditional worship, the, the proper type of Lutheran worship. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my missional hermeneutic is we just do is we just do word and sacrament. And I know he's trying to engage a community, but the, the orientation of the entire article mm -hmm. was toward toward that end. And I, I, that that is one approach. Right. So, yeah. Talk, so, talk to someone who may say yeah, that, two, that should be our approach, Matt. OK, two thoughts on that. Sometimes it helps to, to take a step back and, and to look at not just our tribe, but tribes in general of the Christian church. And what I would say is in my training in city to city, uh, when we were doing church plant training there, one of the, one of the most interesting things was 
they pointed out that the area every church planner struggles to contextualize is worship. Mm. And the reason we struggle to contextualize worship is because we tend to gravitate towards something we like or something we are reacting against. And, and so the idea is every, every church planner, every missionary is going to struggle to contextualize in that area. And so to realize this isn't like a uniquely Lutheran thing. Um, the other question that I really press into people um, is who's the missionary? Like a missionary is somebody that goes out, they learn a culture and a context, they learn a language in order to translate the gospel to people. And the problem with taking the Lutheran worship service and saying, I am going to share the Lutheran worship service and you're going to meet Jesus through that is who are you asking to be the missionary? You're asking the lost person to be the missionary because they're called to learn your culture, your language, your, your way of being so they can meet Jesus. And, and really, that's, that's backwards when it comes to mission. When it comes to mission, it is my job to learn the language, learn the culture, to be able to share the gospel in a contextual way that's honoring to the gospel because the gospel is unchanging, but the gospel contextualizes. But in order to do that, to be able to reach the lost. That's, that's so good. Um, for people that have never heard that, you should rewind that and, and listen. Uh, when we start with worship as the, the primary evangelical tool, we want those that are far from Jesus to become the missionary. That is, that is so, so well said, Matt. So let's press in though to a little, because we do have some Lutheran distinctives yeah. that we're going to keep on the, the moving van, right? So how does it yeah. sound different from a general evangelical missional hermeneutic as we, we pack up and go on mission, Matt? Yeah. Well, the beautiful thing is we were already given that Augsburg Confession 7 and 8 boils it all down to word and sacrament. So and that is the most contextualizable bucket you could possibly have. So I think that is one of our core distinctives that has to go. The other thing that we did when we were doing our church plant, as I said, we had the things that were the non-negotiables. So in that word and sacrament, there's our understanding of theology on baptism, communion, confession, absolution. Those are, those are vital things. Also, our understanding of how we read scripture. You know, reading it through a law gospel framework, reading it through a scripture interpret scripture framework, reading it through justification, sanctification, you know, being able to, to have those lenses and to interpret scripture that way, but then also to step into the world and say, OK, where are the challenges of the world? And then how do I help people see the truth of the word in the challenges they're experiencing in the world? And to read it from a Christ centered lens is huge, too. But I think when you're talking about those things, let's think about all the things we're not talking about. OK, we we had the historic creed because that was an anchor and a grounding. And we had confession, absolution, baptism. We had communion, but we had the Lord's Prayer because obviously Jesus taught them how to pray and he gave them the words of the Lord's Prayer. So that's huge. But what are all the other things we didn't have? Like that doesn't lock us into a specific worship style. It doesn't lock us into a specific worship format. It does not lock me into a specific style of preaching. I can do all those things and I can do a five to 10 minute sermon and I can do all those things and I can do a 45 minute sermon. I can uh, do a sermon where I'm throwing it out and I can do a sermon where I'm inviting questions and feedback. Like, and so, you know, when we look at that, I just kind of get a passion about that. Sorry. But the reality is we've already created this really small contextual bucket. Our problem is we think we need so many more things in order to be distinctly Lutheran. And I think we need to realize that one of the, one of the missional advantages that we have is we have classified distinctly Lutheran into such a simple and contextualizable framework that it allows us to be distinctly Lutheran and yet diverse. And I think we need that diversity in our culture today. And, and one of the reasons we need that diversity is, is number one, if we're asking the worship question, we're asking the wrong question when it comes to mission. Because the reality is, statistically, people are not coming into our churches. So if, if your church is your only vehicle for reaching the lost, I'm not saying you sh it should not be a place where you reach the lost. That's really important. But if it's the only vehicle for reaching the lost, you are already at a loss. Because statistically, Barna found that even self-identified Christians, only about 38% are going to church. 14% aren't sure if they've been going to a church or sacred space. And 40 whatever percent is left. Um, say they don't attend a church regularly. And that's right in line with culture. But 
what you're finding in culture in a 2023 Barna study is that whether you're looking at Gen Z all the way through boomers, what you're finding is that 75 plus percent of people believe in God or higher power and well over 72, 73% of each generational bracket, it goes up depending on which generational bracket you're in, desire to grow in their faith. So you've got this, you've got this thing where, yes, they're not coming into church. And because they're not coming into church, and I teach this all the time, people say, okay, well, they're not interested in Jesus. Well, no, that's not true. They're still interested in Jesus. They're still interested in the conversation. They just need you to do what Jesus did, which was actually show up where people are, meet them in the spots they are, share the truth of scripture, be in relationship which I know creates tension, but be in relationship and then allow the gospel to be shared in those places. And what you're going to find with this highly contextualized bucket we have of Lutheran distinctives that you're actually able to take where people are going, you're going to find the church starts getting planted in all these different places. And it's going to look different and diverse, but it's going to have that golden thread of the gospel, word and sacrament, and our understanding of grace. Dude, What I hear is there are 40% of people in our culture, give or take, that are waiting to have spiritual and we can bring Jesus into the conversation. They're hungry for it. I I think right now, especially in Christ. Over 70%, Tim. Well, I'm, I'm saying the difference between waiting. those that are in church, yeah. the, those that are in oh, church, yeah. and those that would love. So yep. that difference right there. Like, yeah. if we'll just go. If we'll just mm-hmm. go and we'll be a place that wants to meet. We at the ULC, yeah. we talk about felt needs all the time. If we just want to like, kind of meet people where they are, talk about finances or their parenting or politics and bring bring our two kingdom theology into the political conversation like there's a lot of people in our community if leaders will simply go so let's we have a lot of leaders that listen to this podcast right so yep. the the devil is in the details man of like i'm overwhelmed by just caring for the flock right yeah i, I just there's so many so many needs and yeah. i don't even know how i would establish a rhythm of going uh, mm-hmm. So where where and, do you encourage a, a lot of leaders to go? Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. And this this is the thing you you hit the nail on the head. So Lifeway did a research project and they found out that seven out of ten Christians, you know, roughly seventy percent, have never been trained in any way to share their faith, wow. any any form. And so what happens is we we give the sermon on the Great Commission, on going, on sharing the gospel, on sharing all these Lutheran distinctives. And we stop there with the mandate and we don't give people the equipping they need to be able to do it. And so the problem is they don't know how to do it. And one of the reasons they don't know how to do it is because if you were to remove the pulpit and remove the Bible study class, most of us don't know how to do it either. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is we need to take a step back. We need to use all that energy that we waste on what a Lutheran service is supposed to look like and all that energy we waste on whether somebody is contemporary or traditional. And we need to take that and we need to pour it into actually training people how to share faith, how to make a disciple in context, which will also make them stronger in the context of church, by the way. Um, and we need to focus our energy on doing that. And if we don't know how to do that, we need to ourselves walk through a process where we learn how to do that. And the amazing thing is we've spent the last two years walking people through processes like this. And the amazing thing about it is what you start to realize is it doesn't matter what my worship style is. I was hanging out with a guy at the Florida, Georgia pastors conference who does a, a gravitates toward a very traditional style of worship. And he was just raving about the training that we do missionary pathway to help equip everyday leaders. And he was just sharing with his leaders how important this is and how much it's helping them in mission. And one of the reasons it's helping is because we pulled worship off the table and we said, let's just talk about how you share these things in the community where people are going. Because at the end of the day, I I have even recognized in myself, worship is a preference. I prefer a certain style of worship over another style of worship. And I gravitate toward that. My family gravitates toward that. But that's not about right or wrong. And the problem is we've turned that into right or wrong. And we've allowed that to be the conversation instead of saying, what would it look like for us to share our gift? The other big problem that we've run into is fear. We we are so afraid that if we take this gospel out and we share it in the community, we might break it. 
Like we, we kind of treat the gospel like a brand new parent treats a baby, you know, in the sense of like, it's so fragile, it'll break. By the time you have your third kid, you're like, not as fragile as I thought. I, I watched <laughs> my middle son in the backyard trying to do front flips, running, doing a front flip, landing straight on his back, doing it over and over until finally I went out in the yard and said, you are hurting me. You need to stop. Like, like that's, <laughs> that's how rigid, you know, and strong the gospel is, right? We need to treat the gospel like I treat my middle son, which is like, you want to go for it, go for it. Chances are you're not going to break. Okay. God, God protects the gospel. It's our job to share the gospel. Ah, Matt, it's so good. And this is the way of Jesus. This is the way of Jesus. I, I, uh, I'm going to have Chad Lakeys on soon. Um, How the Light oh, Shines so Through is a new book, a new book that he wrote. Um, and we're going to do a two part episode. There is so much gold in, in the hills of that book, man. So nails. He goes off for a chapter on how Jesus never put um, issues ahead of relationship, right? And you can go through the Bible. You're like, oh, yeah, Zacchaeus. Yeah. Oh, yeah, uh, the woman of the well. Oh, yeah, the woman caught in adultery. Oh, yeah, Nick at night, Nicodemus. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, over and over, there's all sorts of issues. And so yeah. can we even in the LCMS, like start to talk about one another, like, well, and, and come yeah. to places. That's what I love about your story in Florida, Georgia, just come to places of agreement on the gospel must get into the ears and hearts. And I'm going to trust you in your respective context. I pray you trust me. But at the end of the day, we can't let 100%. our little issues get in the way of relationship and unity within the church. And we can't then let those issues that are in culture, in, in the secular culture, get in the way of going to people who are lost, who are worshiping all sorts of idols, yeah. just like I'm prone to, and bringing the word of, of love and care centered in the person and work and way of Jesus. Like, can we do that? This is what Jesus invited us into. And it's why the early church yeah. exploded like it did, Matt. There was Jesus took the training wheels off and sent the Holy Spirit and said, you're going to you're going to stay up. You're going to continue to go. Is it going to be messy? Is it going to be hard? Is it going to be difficult? Is it moves from Jew to Gentile? Absolutely. But this isn't about you. Like, get off the throne. This is about me and my work. And I, I have chosen yeah. to use you fragile vessels to carry that that message out into the world. God has to get all of his kids back and he chooses to use messy mm -hmm. little us, right, to, to accomplish his work. Anything more, though, on the way of Jesus in the early yeah. church? I, I would say you hit the nail. You hit the nail on the head with that high trust. Like Jesus, Jesus poured high trust into his disciples. If you read through the gospels and you look at how quickly Jesus sent his disciples out, like we wouldn't do that. Like no, we no would way, not no. have sent them out as quickly as Jesus did, but Jesus trusted in his disciples. He trusted in the mess and he trusted in the fact that they were going to come back and he was going to get a chance to debrief. The mm -hmm. other thing is Jesus, Jesus took people where they were and moved them forward. And I think a missional hermeneutic in a post-Christian culture demands that like we have, we have to, if you need to grieve, grieve, we have to just realize the days of the church being at the center of culture and people pretending that everything they believe lined up with the, with the things that we believe in the church, that's over. We're out of Jerusalem. We're in Babylon. We need to realize that. And we need to operate the way they operated there. We need to love people where they're at. We need to allow the spirit to move them forward. We need to be willing to be in relationship with people that we do not agree with, which I know culturally out, even outside the church is hard. But if we're going to be in a missional hermeneutic, we have to be willing to do that. We have to love people that are not like us. And we have to be willing to navigate that tension. And it does create a tension. Like I have different conversations with my kids because of the people that we choose to love and have in our life and be in relationship with. And, but those conversations are discipling conversations I get to have with my kids and it's teaching them how to navigate a post-Christian culture. Cause the reality is if we keep bickering and fighting about these silly things, instead of stepping into a missional hermeneutic, instead of teaching our church our people in our churches, how to navigate this culture and navigate these relationships in a, in a savvy and authentic way, like we're going to rob our kids of the ability to have a resilient faith. Because I've lived in Bible Belt, Tennessee, and I have lived in post-Christian New Jersey, and I now live in the Midwest. And I can tell you this, each culture and context is different, which is why the high trust thing you're talking about is so important. 
like you can't you can't create a McDonald's style missional ecclesiology and hermeneutic. Okay, it's not going to work the same in St. Louis as it did in New Jersey, as it did in Knoxville. The challenges are different. The people are different, and there are universal principles that transcend culture, which is what we need to really be pouring into people. But we also need to be pouring in just trust and the reality that like we're we're going to hold each other accountable. But we need to focus more on trust because I think we've overemphasized the accountability and we've forgotten that God is going to ultimately hold us accountable. And like he stares deeper into the heart than we can. And so we need to give each other grace and trust. You know, definitely if somebody's veering off to to call them, but to realize that we need to ask a lot more questions before we determine if somebody's veering off. And we need to be willing to do that person to person. And not just, I saw you say this on a video, so I'm going to blast out an email or I'm going to call my DP and have him talk to you. It's like, come on, let's, let's trust each other. Let's, let's realize we're in this together. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned St. Louis, Matt. Um, what do you love about your community context right now in St. Louis? What's hard or surprising about doing ministry and life in St. Louis? Man, you know, okay. So here's here's the thing that's interesting. Like most people would think I'm in St. Louis for a different reason. Um, I'm in St. Louis cause I grew up in Kansas city and my brother married a girl who's three generations from St. Louis. And she said, when we have kids, we will be back around there. And then my parents ended up moving here uh, about six months before we did. And we were doing this trans local ministry and we're like, Oh, wait a second. We can, we can live anywhere. And so we chose it cause it had a better cost of living. It was around family. And what I learned from that experience was there are certain places that certain people are uniquely wired to thrive. Um, and I've, I've had the honor of getting to be in a few places where I felt uniquely wired to thrive. And this is one of them because St. Louis is very familial. So like if you're coming from the outside in, it can be very hard to connect because you're three, four generations in. So if you don't have a family connection, it becomes really hard to connect with people in St. Louis because you don't have that kind of strong area. The other thing that really surprised me was everybody assumes St. Louis is going to be this super political, you know, place in our tribe to try and do ministry. And there are some just amazing missional things happening out here. And some guys that are just doing incredible work in the city. Um, and really the political side, I don't feel that much. Um, and, and I think what I learned was I feel that as much as I choose to feel that. So if you don't want to feel that, then don't pour extra time and attention into it. Like, you know, focus on the things God's given you to do and do them and realize he's given you a great gift in Lutheran theology to do them. So just focus on doing them and don't wait for somebody to give you permission. I think oftentimes, and this is what I learned, not just from St. Louis, but Lutheran church in general, we oftentimes don't do things because we're worried about what somebody might think. True. And I'm like, that's, that's a terrible reason. Like we, we should care more about the lost people around us than we do what somebody who has, uh, some kind of, you know, online profile and wants to throw it out there and they might get upset. I'm like, you know what? The reality is if you're doing mission, somebody's going to be upset about it. Devils certainly be upset about it. So are you going to not do mission? Cause he might get upset. Are you going to not do mission because somebody who might not understand it as much and maybe hasn't poured into that as much is, is going to get upset? Or are you going to put your focus and your attention on the lost and, and discipling those to live out what Jesus clearly commanded them to do, which was to go and make disciples, you know, to be a light to the world. So good. Hey, let's uh, promo what God's doing in the Kairos network for you. It's kind of confusing whenever you talk Kairos too, right? There's yeah. uh, Kairos kind of University <laughs> and then you got Kairos network and you started the Kairos network. We've been affiliated right. with Kairos University now for, for some time. So talk about what God's doing in the Kairos network and missionary pathway. Yeah, it's, it's been crazy. So we, we watched it grow. Um, I, I learned a ton. Uh, essentially, I learned what the flywheel of discipleship looks like. So we started with 18 people in two cohorts and by that was September, 2022, by December of 23, we had 350 in eight countries by January 24, we had 450 in 12 countries by mm -hmm. February 25, we had 550. Now we're right around 800. Yeah. So it kind of goes in this fun ebb and flow. 
And uh, the thing I'm super excited about is my passion has always been church planting. And so training everyday missionaries like you would a church planter. But now we have a cohort of 10 church planters around the country that have gathered together to learn how to become church plant training centers. And so by January, uh, we hope to have five to 10 training centers around the country that will train missional leaders for the church, that will train new church planters who will plant Lutheran gospel centered churches in communities in contextual ways. So like crazy excited about that. And we've seen a real impact in actual staff teams that have walked through missionary pathway together and are now able to be more intentional in their disciple making in every area of their ministry. Um, So that's been really cool um, to get to pour into that. Proud of you and what the Lord has done. You've blessed us here at Christ Greenfield, and it's an honor to partner with you through the ULC. If people want to connect with your your work and join the missionary pathway journey, how can they do so? Yeah, you can check out uh, the Kairos Network uh, dot com, um, or you can email me Matt M A T T at the Kairos Network dot com, and uh, you'll find out about Missionary Pathway on there and a bunch of other training resources that we've got to really help you dig into mission. Um, and then my encouragement too is, and, and this is like, it's so fun to be partnered with you guys and Kairos University and the stuff that you're doing. And I'll oftentimes hear, okay, well, how are you different from this person or this person? And the reality is like, <laughs> you heard the numbers, Same. like the problem is, is so big and the need is so great that I don't care whether you do PLI or joining Jesus or five, two or, or ULC, or you do some kind of crazy mix yeah. of everything like together, like if you're learning how to share the gospel, like I celebrate that because we need more and more people learning how to do that. Amen. That's it. We are united on uh, getting the gospel into as many years as possible. And, you know, there, there are going to be different approaches. Um, and I think, I think different's great. Like we're, we're probably slightly, um, we lean, we're, I don't think we're imbalanced per se, but there's, there's a fair amount of theology that is being learned. Mm-hmm. Lutheran theology with a missional hermeneutic yeah. that's being learned in, in our kind of network, uh, in partnership with Luther House of Studies, et cetera. And, and we also, when the rubber hits the road, man, we need more missionaries, uh, and, and then future pastors with a missionary heart starting churches that start churches. Yeah. Like we agree on, the multiplying need right now in the U.S. and across across the world. We, you will be my witnesses, Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. So this is still our our call, and there's just going to be different approaches. And I celebrate that. I pray that other leaders in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, would celebrate that, and that we would all just have this humble posture that we want to learn. What is God? What is God yeah. doing in your in your network? What's God doing in your network? And that we'd celebrate where God is God is at work. Because at the end of the day, man, we all signed on to the same confession, right? There, there's no there's no difference. We signed yeah. on to the Lutheran confessions, uh, which are a true exposition of the Word of God, and we simply believe Lutheran theology needs to permeate our culture today now more than ever. The yeah. tension filled, law gospel based, balanced uh, law. I mean, it just as it works. It works. I don't know how else to yeah. say it because I'm I'm in so many conversations. I I get to teach. Maybe last last point here. I get to to teach a whole sixty young men and coaches every single Thursday before a Friday night football game. Um, and last week, last week we looked at the book of James. Luther says it's a it's a gospel of straw, right? Which is still needed, <laughs> right? And so yeah. I got I got to do I got to do a Lutheran. A uh, whole class, hour long class on on faith and works, and basically a Lutheran understanding yeah. of of That's faith awesome. and works. And and my evangelical uh, brothers were like, "Oh, this is really good," <laughs> you know. So it even it even works to unite yeah. us across the across the faith, you know, across the evangelical Christian landscape. So anyway, I'm just praying for more One, openness two. rather than a closed mindset. Go ahead, Matt. You gotta you've got to mention you guys are getting ready to launch a missional hermeneutic course. Yeah, that yeah. people can plug into October yeah, 6th. Yeah, it's being released. Share more of that. Yeah, it's it's just going to be great. We're going to all of scripture is God's love story 
to get his lost kids back, right? And so we're going to walk through the six acts of, of scripture uh, from creation to rebellion, to promise, to Jesus, the center point of all of scripture, to the sending of the church, to uh, the restoration of all things when Jesus returns to make all things new. If you don't have that kind of missional hermeneutic on those kind of six acts, and a shout out uh, to Mike Goheen and other missiologists, uh, Bob Newton, others who have contributed uh, epically in that space. We're taking some of the, that and then a lot of, I, I wrote a fair amount on on the mission of God and our need for pastors in collaboration and churches in collaboration to accomplish that yeah. mission by the Spirit's power. I did a fair amount of work on that on my doctorate. So it's taken a lot of that in a uh, in a six week class that we'd love to have as many as many leaders, learners uh, jump on board. You can go to UniteLeadership.org. Again, hit the learning platform in the upper right hand corner and you can have you have free access to the first uh, first set of classes that are available. There are a whole bunch. It's basically flip classroom. It's Thinkific. It's un- using yeah. I think a similar platform. You use Thinkific, right, Matt? Oh, I yeah. We use Thinkific, too. Yeah, uh-huh. it's a major a major driver. And one of the reasons I love it is the stuff that you guys are releasing, the stuff that we've got is what I've learned over the last couple of years when it comes to discipleship and training people to go out, 80% of it is just me putting it in my schedule. And the other 20% is just having a plan. And so if you all are willing to put it in your schedule, steal one of the plans that we have, actually it's not stealing because we're giving it, we're giving it away. We're, we're putting it out there for you. Mm-hmm. Grab one of those And that's all you need. And what you're going to find is it may be a little slower than you think, but that discipleship wheel is going to start turning. Just put it in your calendar, have a simple plan. Doesn't have to be a perfect plan. But if you do that, you will see your church starting to move more toward mission. Amen. Amen. And this is so much fun. Uh, Matt, you're a gift to me. Thank you for your, when I send the email to say, Hey, can you get on and talk about Jesus and mission with me? You say, you say yes. And uh, we'll continue. We'll continue to partner together, man. I'm so excited about what the Lord is doing. And I believe the best days for our churches. And I pray for the Lutheran church, Missouri Synod are out in front of us. If we have that sort of yeah. mission posture, uh, God is on a mission to get all of his lost kids back. And he has a church to accomplish that mission. Let's be a part of it. Huge. It's a good day. Go and make it a great day. This is lead time. Sharing is caring. Like, subscribe, comment, wherever it is you take in conversations like this. And I pray that the outcome of this conversation as you listen to Matt and I talk is joy and then urgency, Mm -hmm. joy and urgency to share the gospel with the people right, right Mm -hmm. in front of you and in all of our various vocations. Uh, And that would be amazing to see uh, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod come alive toward that end. Jesus loves you very, very much. Uh, Thank you, Matt. Awesome. Awesome. Dude, thank you. You've been listening to Lead Time, a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective. The ULC's mission is to collaborate with the local church to discover, develop, and deploy leaders through biblical Lutheran doctrine and innovative methods. To partner with us in this gospel message, subscribe to our channel, then go to the uniteleadership.org to create your free login for exclusive material and resources, and then to explore ways in which you can sponsor an episode. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.